Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that dares to dig just a little bit deeper. It is Monday, December 14th, 2020, and this is episode 62.2. It's our Indie Spotlight for this set of episodes. And as always, we look back at Indies from five years ago. And tonight, we're looking at the film Cresha from director Trey Edward Schultz. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here this evening. I've got Emma Stone here to talk about this movie with me, and it seems like an appropriate movie to discuss right after the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, let me introduce my co-commentators here this evening. First, the brooding son with an oft-quivering lip, Devin Michaels is here. I quiver with hellos. Glad to have you back, Devin. And I'm also very excited to introduce the newest member of the society, uh, the uncle you don't want to see on Turkey Day, the wounded bird who's crashed into too many windshields. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Max Fano to the show. He's going to do a little miming, a little Marceau Marceau, everybody. That's his hello. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me uh, share with you uh, this, our 62nd series of episodes. Here's the schedule. It started on Thursday, December 10th. And of course, tonight is our indie spotlight, the review of the film Cresha. This upcoming Thursday, December 17th, we were going to view the classic film, The Princess Bride. And next Monday, December 21st, will be our 46th sound off. We're going to do a top five William Goldman films based on our discussion of The Princess Bride. We're going to have an announcement, and Alex is going to debut a new segment dealing with below-the-line personnel. This is the trivia I announced on the last indie about what we're going to discuss tonight. And I said we will finally do an indie spotlight on, a, on the film that features the performance that I named as the best by a leading actress in 2015. Cresha Fairchild is that actress, the real life aunt of director Trey Edward Schultz. In fact, most of the cast in the film are real life family members and it did turn out to be a successful gambit because the film won the John Cassavetes Award at the Indie Spirit Awards that year. The award given to the best film made for under 500,000. All right, here is the summary for Cresha. After a 10-year absence, Krisha accepts an invitation to join her strange family for Thanksgiving to try to make amends for the sins of her past. Guys, how is that as a summary? Yeah. It's awesome. short. One of the shorter ones that I do. I'm trying to be more succinct with the summaries, Devin. More well, succinct also, than you usually. You know, you've learned from me on that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Devin's an expert in succinctness. Yeah, <laughs> but let me expound on that. <laughs> Let me segue away. The um, ways in which that you were succinct <laughs> are as follows. The first question I always ask you guys is, had you seen or heard of this movie before having to watch it for this show? No. I, I actually heard it mentioned in an interview with uh, Paul Schrader and Sofia Coppola on an A A24 podcast okay and right. i was like what's he talking about and then you said check it out and i said no way <laughs> and <laughs> then i had anyway. another conversation and then i had dinner <laughs> and then after that i got in the car and i drove no, I uh, anyway <laughs> so this, this show's gonna go longer than half hour um <laughs> so, so uh the, the way indie spotlights work is the one recommending the indie usually goes first and tonight that's me but since we're doing indies from the first year that we started our show, the No Name Cinema Society, I'll let my 2015 self explain what I liked about the film. Here's a clip from the 2015 Oscar preview. I also have a film that you guys have not heard of, or probably haven't heard of, uh, for my best actress, uh, should have been nominated. Let me introduce you to Cresha. The actress's name is Cresha Fairchild, and she's in the movie Cresha. She plays a character named Cresha. My expectations were really low for this movie. It was one of the most amazingly strange but amazingly flawed movies I've seen in a long time. Too flawed to put in my top ten. The performance cannot be denied. It is a powerhouse performance of a flawed, deeply troubled older woman, kind of the opposite of Charlotte Rampling in terms of like the histrionics, but she makes it work very believably. It's like almost watching a documentary to some degree. It's like a docudrama without necessarily a lot of the handheld artifice. It's a movie that like treats a Thanksgiving dinner like it's a horror movie. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> strange. It might be a future indie spotlight at some point. It's a super affecting performance, which is why I have it as best of the year. Okay, so that was me from 2015, and I watched it again. I feel pretty much the same. Um, so that's my uh, opening thoughts. For, let me go to these guys for opening thoughts. Now, Devin is historically bad at opening thoughts, and Max, just so you know, opening thoughts is basically a sentence about it, but Devin's sentences tend to be 200 words long but i would love for him to see if he can do better than that to give a good example since you're new i'm going to let him do it first i never let devin go first i'd love him to give you a good example of what opening thoughts is a sentence how did you feel about the film devin i 
thought it was a fascinating, disturbing, well acted, mostly well executed character drama. Okay, not bad for Devin. Still a lot of words, a lot of commas, but on a Devin scale, that might be as among his better opening thoughts. Max, a sentence or less. Really disturbing, really good, really flawed. That's sort of in line with the, some of what I was saying on uh, back in five years ago, uh, guys. Um, but so let's 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 dig in. Let's dig into it. And I know I, I was effusive about uh, the performance at the center of it, but I but I, I do want to start with direction because ultimately I feel like that's what sets the film apart, specifically the tone, guys. Um, I, I said in the clip from the Oscar preview that the film treats Thanksgiving dinner and Kreisha's ultimate breakdown like a horror movie. And it does so through two elements, music and the camera movement. The music is frequently dissonant and often keeps you uncomfortable and tense, even when nothing particularly scary is happening on screen. But camera-wise, he chooses to use slow zooms now and then, which are frequently used in horror movies. And in other places where there's camera movement, it's often slow and methodical, adding to the sense of foreboding. I also appreciate that for the most part, he eschewed the handheld aesthetic in favor of more locked down frames. Even when the camera moves, it's steadier, like the opening shot is steady cam and not handheld. Meanwhile, in spite of all that, the scene work is very fluid and natural. Family members come in and out of frames freely and exist as if the camera's not even there. Many of the group scenes feel improvised and real, and why not? They are a real family after all. And this adds to the verisimilitude, and often you feel like you're another guest for the holiday. All those elements sharply and purposefully contrast with the other elements, you know, the, the music on one hand and the, and the scene work on the other. Um, and it's appropriate, I think. I mean, the, the combination of those two disparate choices create a very strange, unique, and ultimately successful tone, I, I think, uh, because for Krisha, facing her family again might very well be her greatest fear. And so invoking horror movie tropes works. I think the strange tone takes a while to get on board with, so I think the first 15 minutes might be off-putting initially. And it might have felt grating had the movie lasted longer than 80 minutes. In its current lean and mean state, I think it was an ultimately strong choice. Guys, direction, tone, scene work, what do you think? I agree. I thought that was largely effective. There were moments when it felt like it overstayed its welcome, some of those techniques. Yeah. Sometimes just went 15, 20% further than I wanted them to. A handful of shots that were a bit too proud of themselves, perhaps, and took me out of it for a few seconds. For the most part, I thought that, that was effective for all the reasons you just you just stated, that that it's it's really taking you inside this very diseased person's brain and all of the anxiety that goes with all these very real banal moments, all of those moments that for a healthy person are, are just gonna go right by, for, for this human being, we're getting inside her brain and seeing all of those horrific components under the surface. That was struck really well with those techniques. Yeah, and I mean, like the flaws that you're talking about, I, I think we will get into. And overall, I think I insinuated, at least in the 2015 clip, that the film is rough around the edges, which is pretty common for a young filmmaker. You also use the word flawed, Max. Is that sort of what you were thinking about? I mean, I love the movie and I agree with pretty much everything that's been said. I have to say the stylized cinematography is one of the biggest flaws. It just took me out of the film. I was hooked right from the beginning. This sort of slow close up on her, which is obviously very stylized, but in the first moment of the picture, I'm yours. You got me. And then all of a sudden these zooms with this like really atonal dissonant music that was lifted in my opinion straight out of the shining were inside her brain and it's all rattling 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 and i thought wait a minute you know let's not let's not go there because i know she's going through stuff you know let it unfold clearly she can handle herself in front of the camera this woman was amazing I know I'm, I'm rambling and going off, but there's one it's other- pulling Devin, Call it pulling a Devin. I know I'm pulling a Devin, I'm pulling a Devin. But there's one more reason why I felt like the stylization of the camera work was flawed is because there are some genius moments. The camera's going around her in the island of the kitchen and she's walking counterclockwise. And then her son is walking farther away and then he takes the stairs and goes up 
And I'm like, this is genius because I've been taken out of the film so many times prior to that with these slow zooms and these fast zooms. And I just wanted the camera to simply be locked down more so that I could appreciate the moments that were like mind bogglingly cool. You're appreciating the scene work, it sounds like. That whole thing that you're talking about is what I refer to as scene work, the way that it's acting and blocking for camera sort of intertwine, basically, you know, breaking down a scene almost theatrically and building it for the cinema. That is a great example of that. I was all put by that opening shot initially. And then I did like that steady cam upon her first arrival. And once the music comes back and the zooms, I was uncomfortable until I realized what they were doing. And certainly it was better the second time around, but that's what I meant by off-putting. Those choices took me a bit to get on board with, but eventually I got there. It sounds like you never fully got there. I was just too not disturbed by the camera work in the way that a good horror film makes you kind of disturbed, but taken out of the movie. Do you at least agree that it was a very specific and purposeful choice and not just them fooling around? Whether you agree or disagree with that, it had its purpose. It had its purpose, I just don't think it was really effective. I agree that it pushes a little too far. It sort of waters down some of those camera movements and stagings that are so effective. It's just a matter of degree. By having just a few too many of them, there were moments when I was taken out of it, especially in the first half before you get used to the unusual way that the, that the filmmaker is folding you. We're saying the same thing in different ways. The filmmaker decided, I need to push it. I need to emphasize that something's going on in her mind that's not right. Early on, a choice was made that for Krisha, Thanksgiving is a horror movie. And if you really look right. at this, the things that are at stake here, like the things that happen, in the grand scheme of things, they're small things. Turkey, dinner is ruined. It's a choice to highlight personal fears. Yes. You know, and comparing it to, you know, the fear of a monster or the fear that, that might have been in a movie like The Shining. Even though we don't get very many of the details of, of what's turned her into this current terribly flawed, terribly in pain person, it speaks to all of our pain. It speaks to all of us who have struggled with mental health, with family turmoil, with all kinds of lineage of both of the above. That was very effective. A lot of the things that we're talking about, the rough around the edges element, the flawed elements, are first time director kind of things. And I think at this point, Trey Edward Schultz has proven himself as more than just a one trick pony. Waves came out last year, which has its own issues, but very different issues. But I think this film is impressive to me from a young filmmaker point of view, especially the way he, he uses detail it's in the mise en scène. As soon as we meet Krisha, her dress is sticking out of her car right. door. Just from that image, and nobody refers to it, she doesn't even realize it. You sort of know she's a bit of a mess right from that. It's a great, subtle, but evocative choice. Um, the uncle doing karate for a moment when he thinks he's having a private moment. For a character that doesn't play that much, it offers a lot of insight. Several details of cooking the turkey, removing the innards as you do, uh, which parallels facing your family, which could be equally gut-wrenching, not quite that literally. Many young directors, for example, don't think to shoot cutaways, and this movie is full of them. Many of them utilizing the fact that it is actually him and his actual family, whether it's pictures on the wall or home movies. To some degree, you could argue it's like cheating because he didn't necessarily place those things there. It's not created like from scratch like many sets would be, but he used them well, all add up to successful and self-aware usage of the mise-en-scene. Totally, I agree with everything you just said. I think it was crazy impressive. I'm glad you brought up the dress. I said, this is gonna be worth watching. Not because it happened, but because it happened. And like you said, it's not referred to. It's very subtle. You might've missed it. Such a clear character point. So many of those early character beats made the characters so crystal clear. We're gonna talk about Krisha herself in a second, but as good as she is, several of the other performances can be rough at times. Now, I'm sure the casting of his own family was a budgetary necessity. It's not like he's repeated that in any of his other films. And to the director's credit, he seems to know which of his family members to feature heavily and which to downplay. It's not a deal breaker as it is in some films because we're mostly focused on Krisha and she's amazing. And the worst of them for me might actually be the director himself. Bill Wise, who I think is the only other professional actor in the cast, they were strong to me. The other actors almost feel like they're in a mumblecore film. Trey himself and some of the fringe family members stood out to me in a minor negative way performance wise. You're in this, you're in this, and then Somebody's like clearly not a real actor and takes me out a little bit. I mean, it didn't bother me. The verite was so sharp that 
I didn't need some of those tinier moments to be perfectly acted. Most of the acting I thought was excellent. I do think Bill Wise is terrific in this. I think his character is fascinating. He plays that just right. In a lesser actor's hands, that role really could have gone to caricature, gone to somewhere less effective. That scene between them, it's cut up a lot with parallel editing, but it's one of the best scenes in the movie and it feels so honest, it feels completely improv, sort of the freedom of that scene. Those things can go terrible and be a train wreck, but that particular scene really felt alive and fresh to me. I agree. I actually would say Devin's spot on. I think all the acting was excellent, even by the non-actors. One of the things that I had issue with was uh, a little bit of the writing. You know, you have this little moment She's spying on her son, helping him with his computer. That whole scene was weak. Here's a character. We're not going to really let him say anything. But then in one moment, he's going to say the sort of apex of what is difficult for him. I'm just going to wear my issue on my shirt sleeves. I think it's a performance thing because I do think it felt like bad improv. It felt like improv that went awry. Those lines that you're talking about feels like an actor not as comfortable as improv searching for some way to fill the moments. Full disclosure, I know that actor personally. He was in uh, Kelly's show last year, Chris Dubeck. I thought his performance was very good. He did suffer from being told to improv clearly in that moment and not being entirely comfortable with it. And then frankly, even the best improvisers are only gonna be good about 60, 70% of the time. I fully believe that putting actors in that situation is bad direction. We are, he obviously does so many strong things and he had promised, it's, it's young direction is probably what I should say. Uh, that brings us to Creature herself. Uh, and we've talked a lot about her in these other segments, but just to bring it full circle, um, as someone who makes indies, I'm often cynical about indies. And, and that cynicism frequently dictates my expectations when I see somewhat non-professional actors in films. If they do deliver a compelling performance, it's often that the director gets them to relax and play themselves as opposed to actually building a character. Trey Schultz wouldn't have been able to get through a day of filming if Krisha were anything like her character. I do think this is a fully realized performance. She executes emotional extremes believably and powerfully. She navigates as thorough a nervous breakdown as I've seen on screen in recent years. She carries her pain, her fear, and her hope with her in every gesture, every choice. Her vulnerability when she tries to connect with her estranged son and the way she tries to be cool about it, play it off, is truly heartbreaking to me. Or the awkwardness of her hovering over her nieces and nephews while they play a game of Mad Libs. She simultaneously hopes to be included and also to connect with her son. And she just stands there during this scene, but she's so expressive in doing so. And finally, there's something so fearless to me about the performance, the emotional nakedness that she as a performer is willing to bear it's kind of balls to the wall in that way and always believable, always honest. That's why to me, guys, she was the best actress of 2015, as I mentioned in the clip from five years ago. Max, I believe you're on board. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not privy to all the other performances in 2015, but she rocked. Yeah, I agree. It's a beautiful performance. One of the ways we all continue to learn how to act is from noticing some of the ways that a performance like that is, is so good. And I think that one of the ways that I noticed when I was watching this, in every moment on screen, she doesn't really know the answer to what her, her predicament is. She just has no idea. All of her desperation, even in the moments when she's having better moments and having a laugh or two, um, she still just has that core unknown going on about, about what's going on in her own brain. And, and I think to your point, Devin, the best of the movie allows space for that and enhances the unknown. Max, I'll let you introduce it. What's coming up next? It's the T word. The T word where we get to talk about the themes of the film. Davey used to hate this segment because he didn't like to dig a little deeper, but that's what we do in the show. We open up the can of worms on what this movie was really about to us. And I've got three big themes that are really interconnected here. But before I do, I'll let these guys see if they have anything. And I'm worried about this because it could take forever. The main thing that comes to mind right away, which was pulled off so effectively with some, with a couple of those later sequences with the sister in the bathroom. And the theme 
to me was the limitations of empathy that we all need to practice more empathy and yet it's not without its limitation it interferes with our own journey we're only willing to go out of our own paths so much for other people and you can call that solipsistic or narcissistic or whatever sometimes i feel like we'd rather just get rid of the problem rather than reach out that olive branch i didn't have that but it's tangentially related to one of my themes here uh, max i think that's great for me the overarching theme of the film is more of a question which i would phrase as uh what does it mean to be a parent? So family. Okay. Yes, but but she's she's obviously frozen in a kind of childhood because she can't mature. It is about well, family, but but that, I that to me is related to my my what I consider to be the the theme that, that, that hits home the most to me. It's related to both of you to some degree, but you know, in terms of the permanent childlike state. Uh, you know, I think to me, there's a lot about mental health in the film. Devin talked about the limitations of empathy. I'm calling the fragility of human nature and human emotions. It's very easy to look at Krisha and decide she's damaged and therefore of no use. And to Devin's point, you're limited in your empathy for her. She makes people uncomfortable just by her presence. She wants so badly not to be that way, but can't break out of the cycle, especially around the easy trigger of family. On one level, it seems as if the family is extending an olive branch by inviting her to begin with, but she's never truly made welcome. She feels their judgment, their discomfort, their reticence, their anger. Most of it under the surface. Some of it, in the case of Doyle, is above it. Many people in the same situation would feel as hopeless as she does and feel, fine, if you think I'm crazy and I'm going to have an episode, I'll show you an episode. If you feel like you can't escape their negative expectations, many people often feel the need to meet them. It punishes them and also frees you from having to constantly fight the negativity. It's much easier to succumb to it. The family's conscience is clear because they made the invitation, but truly she never really had a chance. And ultimately that's about a lack of understanding and also a lack of real compassion for mental health issues. And it's sort of tangential to your theme that I do think their lack of empathy comes from a lack of understanding about what's really going on with Krisha. Instead of just seeing her as damaged goods, they don't see the mental health problems that underneath it. No, absolutely. I think one of the things that is truly great about this film is how it captures these are all well-meaning people. Everyone wants things to not be awkward, to not be painful. The same way Krisha is still in a certain stage of arrested development, so are we all. Nobody knows enough about how to make this work. We just are all trapped in these human threads, even when we mean, really mean well, genuinely, and are trying to connect, there's a limit to how successful we can be. And the paradox on top of that paradox, which is, we should still try, even though it's ultimately doomed to failure so much of the time. We have to still up the percentage as much as we can. And we do up the percentage when we do learn more about mental health. Paradoxes on top of paradoxes. So I hope you wrote some of that down, Max, in order to respond to it. The thing that makes this feel like a horror film was the decision by the filmmaker to create this lack of empathy. Because at a certain point, I found myself asking myself, self, um, <laughs> you know, who is the main character? Because it's interesting to choose a main character who is quote unquote unlikable and then create a scenario in the film where nobody accepts her. And what I think we're discovering guys is communication is an offshoot theme as well. Like that's what I'm hearing from listening to you is is the, the communication or the inability to communicate, uh, you know, and the and the foundation for trouble and and heartache that that, that could lead to, um, which segues me to uh, my other theme of family. Um, and DB used to always say family whenever I asked him uh, for every movie we covered. It was low hanging fruit to say that family was a theme of a movie, but it is kind of true here. And it's interesting that, that Schultz would use his real family in a movie that it shines what I perceive to be a very negative light on the impact family can have. And you know, we talked about a little bit of the mental health theme, but on a more global level, the imprint family can have on our psyche is powerful and at times can feel inescapable. I was struck by the constant competition between the cousins and how Schultz was constantly intercutting that with other scenes. And to me, it speaks to the larger competition we often feel with family. Perhaps because you come from the same place, theoretically the same start in life, one feels more threatened by the accomplishments and life journey of family members. 
Krisha wasn't able to find a stable relationship where she could raise her son. She didn't settle down like her sisters, and therefore she's different and perceived as less than. And that kind of judgment snowballs. And let's look at the scenario of the film more closely. What really happened? She ruined Thanksgiving dinner somewhat inadvertently. In the larger scheme of things, who really cares? But everything is magnified when it comes to your family. This was her test, and she didn't pass it. But as I said before, they never really gave her a chance. And let's face facts. It seems that 10 years away from her family were good for Krisha. Our sense is that she had gotten some of her stuff together, but those old demons were still buried there, the kind of demons that only a family can bring out. So, guys, uh, that sort of related to what we we're talking about, but but just a, an additional uh, perspective on it. Anything I said spark more thoughts? Whoever writes your script, JV, is amazing. <laughs> I'll take that. Max, Devin, have- Max as, uh, as someone who's done met- many more of these shows, let me just officially welcome you or initiate you to the fact that JB is always going to be 10 times more prepared. So there's, there's no way to compete. Well, no. there, there, that's not true. There is actually very specifically a way to compete. One could prepare to compete. One could, but, you know, we like we like this dynamic. That's probably more accurate. Um, <laughs> Devin, do you have anything additional about family? Because sadly enough, I've got one more. I think you hit it on the head in terms of it does seem pretty clear that she did get her act together, that she has been doing better, that she has been sober for a certain uh, undefined amount of time. Uh, All of these things are in place, but they're ultimately fragile. And what makes this narrative so compelling and so in need of a horror score and a horror camera shot list is because it's ultimately doomed. Those demons only family has the power to bring up are always still sitting there. It was this long day's journey into night. Little O'Neill reference. That's how cultured we are. On <laughs> Just to follow that up about family, though, you know, disaster at a Thanksgiving dinner, that takes modeling to make that work as a film. And I think that was done. To get to the point you just said about, you know, we can't get over our demons, that sort of leads to my final and sort of tangential theme. And to me, I kept thinking about regret in this movie. It's an old line, but it's unfortunately and painfully true. There are some mistakes you never stop paying for. Krisha likely had mental and emotional struggles for a long time, which probably led to the mistakes that she made that made her family can't seem to really forgive her in the vicious cycle of life. Dozens of years of pain could have been avoided with proper mental health care and attention. But to some degree, Krisha can't seem to forgive herself either. And as much as I say the family didn't give her much of a chance, I'm not sure Krisha gave herself much of a chance. She seems very self-aware that the potential for disaster is there. And those fears come out in the terrific performance that we keep talking about. It's amazing how much we let the past dictate our future. Krisha wasn't able to let go of the pain of the past, knowing she was partially responsible for the pain that she caused herself and others. She was able to block it out when she was away from the family, but now confronted with them, 60 years of feeling less than come rushing back and it would take a particularly stable person to withstand that deluge. It seems avoidable to an outsider. Why can't she just let it go and move on? Regret is something that hangs over you like a dark cloud that you can't seem to control. She, like many others, puts the power in the hands of others. If they forgive me, it'll be okay. But perhaps the real tragedy of the film is that Krisha only ever really needed to forgive herself. Guys, regret. Yeah, I mean, that that's... That's what makes so many moments in this movie so poignant is that intimate look at a human being unable to forgive themselves, unable to practice a certain amount of empathy for herself. That's what makes this tragedy really feel unavoidable. It's absolutely true. You know, there's this lifelong or age-long argument whether or not people can change. And I think this film speaks to the idea that people don't change. It highlights how extremely challenging it is to evolve in a meaningful way. I mean, I realize what you're saying is true in the greater context of whether or not one can change. Through the perspective of this film, I feel like it states people don't change. Certainly not if you're really awesome like me. Most people don't want me to change. This is true. <laughs> more prepared. And that's <laughs> people don't want, people want me to come prepared. <laughs> Trivia for the next indie. Uh, we continue talking about 25, 2015 indies. Um, I talked 
last time about how Krisha Fairchild should have been nominated for a Best Actress Oscar. Our next indie did receive a nomination in the in that category in 2015. So we're going to go back to a film that was listed on one of the top 10 lists that we announced in 2015, but not mine. And that'll be uh, later this month or next month uh, will be our next indie. Um, our classic movie discussion is coming up next. And we're going to talk about one of the best loved 80s films. Princess Bride is coming up this Thursday. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.